who is joining us for webinar number 162, since the Andean Health Organization, Hippolyto Nano Agreement, started a webinar series in May 2020. To begin, we will give two key messages. First, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a major setback in regular vaccination in our countries, which has increased the risk to recurrence and outbreaks of dangerous immune preventable diseases. The pandemic has taught us the relevance of strengthening health systems and developing all relevant strategies to ensure vaccination for all people throughout their life course. Second, the COVID-19 pandemic teaches us that the capacities built and strengthened in these three years should not be rolled back. Research, epidemiological and genomic surveillance, vaccine and drug development, deployment of prevention measures and good communication remain fundamental for a caring society. Under this premise, the ORAS CONU is very clear about its coordinating role and continues to open dialogues and intervention with the participation of all sectors to ensure a dignified life for the inhabitants of our countries. Reflections on these and other priorities relevant to health and well being can be found in the monthly Noti Salud Andina newsletter available on the website of the Andean Health Organization. In accordance with the above, today, Tuesday, March 7th, we open our virtual doors to discuss a topic of great importance for our region with webinar number 162, a new pandemic treaty agreement. Why do we need it and why should it contribute? We invite you to leave your name, organization, and country in the comment box of the Facebook Live or YouTube Live chat. In that same space, you can leave your questions or send them via email to webinarorasconu at gmail.com. In this webinar, we will follow the usual dynamics. We will start with the institutional greeting, followed by the lectures of our speakers, and then we will move to the question and answer session. To access the certificate of attendance, as usual, in any of the chats on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, you will find a fixed link. You must fill out a brief survey and then leave your data for the issuance of the certificate, and it will be sent in the coming days to your emails. To start this important day, I give the floor to Dr. Maria Carmen Calle, Executive Secretary of the Andean Health Organization, who will give the welcome and institutional greeting. Go ahead, Dr. Calle. Thank you, Lucho. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to everyone attending today's virtual meeting with a special relevance linked to global public health and in particular to proposals to improve the response to a public health emergency of international importance, such as COVID-19 and other emergencies. To put ourselves in context, it is important to mention that from ancient times until the mid 19th century, the threats to human humanity were related to wars that generated famines and epidemics that caused the loss of millions of human lives. Threats to which climate change and growing social inequalities have been added in modern times. The advance of industrialization in the mid-19th century 
brought as a consequence a great migration from the countryside to the cities, an increase in trade, improved means of transportation and communications, better health and food conditions, increased transit of people and trade through land and sea routes. But this came at a great cost and was accompanied by profound social changes. The cholera epidemics in Europe in 1830 and 1847 accelerated the process of reaching an international agreement to control these infectious diseases, plague, cholera, and yellow fever, and to establish public health measures for their rapid control with the least impact on trade. In the year of 1851, the first International Sanitary Conference was held, and a hundred years later, the first International Sanitary Code was approved, which monitored and controlled six serious diseases such as cholera, plague, yellow fever, smallpox, relapsing fever, and typhus. In 1969, this code was replaced by the International Sanitary Regulations, IHR, with monitor and control cholera, plague, and yellow fever. The presence of a major outbreak of cholera in South America, Ebola hemorrhagic fever in Africa, and a new outbreak of plague in India, the limitation for the control of only three diseases, the dependence of countries on official notification, and the absence of a formal internationally coordinated mechanisms let states to meet again to modify the 1969 IHR. The International Sanitary Regulation adopted by the 58th World Health Assembly in 2005 is a legally binding instrument covering measures to prevent the international spread of infectious diseases. It breaks with several paradigms and moves from eliminating simple border control to containment of the source of the disease. From a list of diseases to surveillance of all public health threats, and finally, from eliminating pre-established measures to a set of tailored responses. The new regulation needs to develop basic capacities for surveillance and response tasks, such as strengthening health systems, epidemiological surveillance, laboratories, preparedness, case management, infection control, social mobilization, and communication. The COVID-19 pandemic put the application of this regulation to test in all countries of the world. However, the results require a better evaluation of the role it played in the management of the crisis. Coordinated and joint work is unavoidable to adapt the laws related to the management of health emergencies at different levels of decision making and with a multi sectoral scope. Improvement of basic capacities in the alert and response systems, sharing of information in real time, and adequate financing 
to have a comprehensive surveillance of the environment, human health, and animal health, so that events can be detected, evaluated, and notified as early as possible with the objective of developing the One Health approach. To learn about these proposals, we have invited high-level professionals with experience, expertise in this topic. I welcome Dr. Laura Chinchilla Miranda, former president of the Republic of Costa Rica, Dr. Dame Barbara Stocking, former executive director of Oxfam Great Britain, Dr. Patricia Garcia, former Minister of Health of Peru, and Dr. Herbert Cuba, public health advisor, who will address the topic a new treaty agreement, agreement for pandemic, why do we need it, and what should it contribute? Welcome. Thank you, dear Dr. Calle. After the greeting of our secretary, I introduce myself. My name is Luis Bengolea More, medical epidemiologist, coordinator of health in border and thematic areas. And today I will be gladly in charge of moderating this webinar. After this preamble, we welcome Dr. Laura Chinchilla Miranda. Dr. Chinchilla was the first woman to be elected president of Costa Rica in the 2020-2014. She previously served in the positions of Minister of Public Security in 1996 and 1998. Congresswoman from 2002 to 2006, Minister of Justice in 2006 to 2008, and vice president in, from 2006 to 2010. In recent years, Dr. Chinchilla has worked as an advisor to international organizations and conferences on issues of women leadership, human rights, rule of law, democracy, and sustainable development. She is vice president of the World Leadership Alliance Club de Madrid and co-chairman of the Inter-American Dialogue and the Concordia Summit and member of several organizations such as the International Leaping Committee and IDEA International. She's also a member for a panel for a Global, Health, Global Public Health Convention. She has taught at Georgetown University, the Technological Institute of Monterrey, Mexico, in the University of Sao Paulo. She's a political scientist with a master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University and honorary doctorates from the United Nations Peace University, Kyoto University of International Studies, and Georgetown University. Dr. Chinchilla will talk about the introduction of why this treaty is important, especially for Latin America. Thank you, dear doctor, for your presentation. And we welcome you to start your, dessert, your presentation. Good morning. Thank you very much, Luis, for the introduction to Mari Carmen too. And many of you, while I'm sharing my screen, will ask, and what is a politician talking with experts in health about topics in health. And I think that you will share with me that most of the problems that we face for the treatment of this pandemic had to do with the poor political decisions or political decisions that were taken not in an adequate fashion and to talk about governance in general, and this is very linked with this topic for today's seminar. So I thank for the space that is open for us on behalf of the panel for a global public health convention. I have with me 
two other members of this panel. This is Barbara's talking, who will follow once I'm done, and then Patti Garcia, who will also have a presentation. In this five minutes, I will basically would like to get general information with regards to Latin America, because Latin America is a region that was hit hard by this pandemic. And for these reasons, it may be one of the regions that will most benefit with the progress or the or way to a new treaty in terms of pandemics. Just briefly, I would like to tell you, because I'm the first presenter on behalf of the panel, that the panel for a global public health convention is an independent coalition of global leaders, not strictly from the health areas. Some of us come from the government, from politics, committed to strengthening the world's capacity to prevent, prepare for, and respond to future pandemic threats. We advocate for a treaty to be adopted by the world's heads of states that ensures effective cooperation, transparency, accountability, and compliance with agreed standards. Our partners include different organizations so we can continue strengthening the coalition's effort. Now, going into the subject, it is obvious, in particular for the community that I'm addressing, that Latin America was the hardest hit region, not only in terms of health, but also in the economic and social terms. Well, it was evident that we cannot pretend to continue working health dimension in our countries as something that is an isolated compartment from the economic and social phenomena. Health is a fundamental pillar for the economic and social development of any nation. The pandemic was Despite being a health crisis, it resulted in the region's worst crisis in more than a century. It is therefore, as I was saying, one of the regions that with the most to gain from a new treaty if we change the conditions to which the crisis was managed in globally. And here I will leave you some data that show the, the mortality rate, accumulated death rate. And we can see in this light blue line that represents our region, how at some point Latin America was on top of any other region or any other country in terms of death caused by the pandemic. At some point, we had 30% of death worldwide, despite that we only are 8.5% of the total population in the world. But as Luis mentioned at the start, it's not only the death caused by the pandemic, this had an impact in the entire health sector, the number of people accessing health services and coverage of kicker service decreased. And therefore, it caused neglect of other diseases and health setbacks with other type of conditions. It was very sad to see that Latin America had the worst records at some point with a large economy such as Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia among the 20 countries 
with the highest number of infected people worldwide or Peru leading the world ranking with the highest number of deaths per million inhabitants. But as I was saying, it was not just health. The GDP, GDP contraction was the region where most wealth was lost compared to the rest of the world with 22 million more people were added to poverty and 8 million people went to extreme poverty. 46% of children suffered an educational blackout because they were completely disconnected. And if we break down in relation to the impact on women, it has been estimated a 10 years of setbacks in the inclusion of women in the labor market. So these devastating results were not only due to the vulnerabilities of our health systems, but also put on evidence and was the product of the weaknesses in intra-regional and international cooperation and coordination. We came to a point, I remember, despite that three of the largest economies are part of G20, and despite that we are very active in some topics like climate change and United Nations, when we are in the worst part of the pandemic, only 7% of vaccines of the, of the COVAX were reaching to Latin America. So Latin America had also a major difficulties to coordinate and to work at the intra-regional and international level. So to conclude this motivation, we have not to focus not only on how to strengthen our health systems to make them more resilient facing possible pandemics, but also how to strengthen in and improve the international system to make them more effective. A successful and responsible strategy must not only incorporate the reform of national health systems, but also reform of the international system for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and management. Thank you very much. We will invite Barbara. Yes, I don't know what happened with Luis. Thank you, there, Dr. Laura, for your excellent presentation and this wonderful introduction to our discussion that we'll have later about the impact of the pandemic on the global level, but especially in Latin America. Dr. Laura has presented who are making up the panel for a global public health convention. And this is very important because it is made up by very high level professionals, politicians, with decision-making capacities, the academic world, and many other participants with a purpose to promote a new treaty where governments will commit in an effective manner for cooperation, the accountability with compliance of standards, with transparency for the prevention and control of future outbreaks that will come in the mid-term with the same 
characteristics or magnitude. It is also important what she has shown us in terms of statistical data that reflect the reality and the impact in Latin America that since June of 2020 to the end of 2021, it become, became a space with the presentation of large number of cases and deaths. It was the epicenter of the world outbreak, and that needs to be highlighted because it generated many action, important actions and that individual on part of the governments to provide a response to this emergency. I also believe that it is important to highlight the way how we can partner to achieve consensus and to establish new procedures that will speed up the implementation of the health sanitary regulation. But not only to the health sector, but jointly working with other spaces that are making decisions to deal with the economy, to look at transportation, tourism, aviation. These are sectors that have to do with an immediate response to a public health emergency of international importance. Thank you very much, Dr. Laura. I will ask you to please stay, remain online for the Q&A. We will now extend a warm welcome to Dr. Dame Barbara Stocking. Dr. Barbara Stocking is the chair of a panel for Global Public Health Convention. She is pres President Emeritus of Murray Edwards College, University of Cambridge, having been in this post from July 2013 to August of 2021. In March 2015, she was appointed chair of the Independent Panel of Experts to assess WHO's response to the Ebola outbreak. The report was published in July 2015. And from May 2001 to February 2013, Dr. Barbara was chief executive of Oxfam GB, and before that, a member of the top management team of the NHS. As regional director for the southeast of England, and then as the founding director of the NHS Modernization Agency. The doctor will talk about what have we learned about COVID-19 and what should be implemented to stop the pandemic in the future. Go ahead, Dr. Stockton, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And thank you to Dr. Kaye and to all of us for giving us this opportunity to speak to you. Um, I am going to switch my microphone off, my my um, picture off, because I gather it's it's causing some difficulties with communication. Um, but thank you very much for putting up the slides. Let me um, begin by this question. Then we really need to understand what went so wrong with COVID-19. And it's on this slide. It just shows that one of the key issues was preparedness. Although some countries had good public health systems, no one had the involvement of the whole of government. And as people have been saying, that um, the a pandemic hits all aspects of society. They didn't actually consider, for example, communications to the public, and they had not had simulations to test out whether their preparedness really worked. But perhaps one of the biggest gaps was what happened in February 2020 there were outbreaks taking place, but governments did not respond. They, they, what they did was to have a wait and see approach. Now, why is that so bad? Well, the issue is, of course, with infectious diseases, they have exponential growth. So you're talking about um, things moving from an outbreak to an ep epidemic um, very, very quickly in hours and days, not months. 
So there was a real problem that we lost the time in the, at that period, which might have been the time that we controlled and stopped a pandemic. Even after then, there were often uh, different governments taking decisions that were really completely against good scientific advice from WHO. And as Dr. Kaye noted before, we do have international health regulations, but in this outbreak, and also in previous epidemics um, and outbreaks of, of various international infectious diseases, governments did not do what was required of them in those health regulations. But we had no way to hold governments to account for not uh, responding, which you know extremely well, is that the inequities in the global public goods the equipment, the PPE equipment, the tests, the vaccines, the drugs were not available to people in so many countries of the world. So we know um, a lot of what was wrong. But of course, if we have a new treaty, we are really going to have to have one that holds countries to account. If you don't do that, then you're back into the situation of the international health regulations. And people will once again say, well, we don't need to deliver this. Just to be clear, at present, we can't stop um, outbreaks happening. I, I hope in future, and I, I'm sure we all hope in future, that through the One Health system of looking at both humans and animals and birds and all their health, that we will be able to find a way to stop breaks, uh, particularly of transmission from animals and birds to humans. But at the moment, we're not able to do that. What we want is to stop outbreaks becoming epidemics and pandemics than we did with COVID-19. So this treaty um, contain, and my panel believes it's, there are four principles, if I could just have the next slide. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, first of all, the, there is the issue of solidarity. All the countries have to operate together because we know that nobody is safe until everyone is safe, as Dr. Tedros from WHO has put it. But it's more than just solidarity. We have to have equity. And that's equity not just in access to drugs and other measures and vaccines. It is about equity in the government of how all this works. And in fact, equity about the provision of financing because so many of the low income countries cannot do what's required without finance from others. And then there's the issue of transparency. It's really important that countries declare um, what their circumstances are in relation to a, a particular disease. And they provide not only data, but of course the, the samples so that genetic processing can take place. And as I've said, the fourth issue is accountability. Countries must be willing to be accountable to um, their own populations, um, but also to each other. Because um, if one country doesn't do things, it can allow that those uh, uh, diseases to continue. But also we need an accountability system in this treaty that will make that possible. So first of all, we have to say, well, accountability for what? And if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, as I've said, it's accountability for delivering data samples, but it's also accountability in preparedness um, and, and finding out what level of preparedness different countries are at. It's about response, the accountability for doing the right things as required. And then it's accountability for delivering on equity and any other requirements that are set out in the treaty as it comes into place. So let me just talk a bit more on accountability in the next slide about the mechanisms for accountability. So as I've said, the first thing is preparedness. And we need the ongoing commitment and the financing for countries to be ready. Now, 
what is being discussed at the moment is that there must be peer review, at least, amongst countries um, against a whole set um, of, of requirements which allow, prepare, which, which agree and produce a preparedness. And that's being talked about as um, at the UHPR, it is, um, the Universal Health um, Preparedness um, Reviews. But the panel that I work for also says very clearly that just peer review by other countries is not enough. We are going to really need independent assessment. And we do have to recognise that countries won't be at the same state. And it would be great if people actually set their own agendas for how what they could do to deliver increased preparedness over a period of, say, two or three years um, from the, the position that they started in. And of course, with the support and the financing made available them, for them to do it. Preparedness, though, you can review every two or three years. Response, though, is much more tricky because you have to be very fast acting as the pandemic starts taking, taking place and moving and different actions will be needed at different time. So what my panel is recommending is that there is an independent body that does the assessment. Um, and that body would be a bit at arm's length from WHO, but, uh, uh, but itself would have immediate access to countries. And when it had done its particular analysis of how they were responding, there would be public statements about the results. And that allows the call also from, to, to come from the independent assessment body to actually make improvements in what they're doing. So there are talks at the moment, um, actually in Geneva, um, about a, a beginning to be good conversations about accountability and what the right mechanisms would be uh, for this all to work. The question is then, what are the incentives and even disincentives for countries to want to go along with this? So if I could have the next slide. Thank you. Now, the first incentive ought to be, um, a, if you like, um, a moral one, which is that we're all in this together. As I've said, we're only as strong as the weakest and we need accountability to each other if, if it's going to work and we can stop pandemics. But also we think that public reporting by an assess assessment body of the sort I've talked about would be very positive because people, countries like to show they are doing well and are concerned if they're not. But there's no formal ways that we can provide incentives. We can perhaps for the low income countries, but not to middle and rich countries. And one suggestion that's been made is that in the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, there is an article which reviews, which allows reviewing of financial stability of countries regularly. And if you put some uh, measures in, which were about the preparedness and response for uh, pandemics, then that could be counted in that. And that might be something to help um, push people, if you like, into doing the right thing in this treaty. But the one thing that's very clear is that there's no way in this treaty you could have real sanctions. That would probably be very hurtful to the people of countries as we, get, as we go along. So I think uh, what the, my panel is saying very much is that um, incentives have to be very positive. We don't want a system that is blaming countries because it really will not work. We want one that helps support um, by technical support or by finance countries to really do what is needed to be done. And as I say, not to be blamed for it, especially when they don't have the resources. So what are the um, issues that are, are really unresolved at the moment? If I could have the next slide. The first one is the funding. There is now a pandemic fund that is underway in the World Bank. Um, and it will shortly people will be receiving some of the funds from it. But it only has at the moment $1.5 billion in it. And that's a real problem because it's been estimated that we need to put in $10.5 billion uh, every year to really make it possible to build up the preparedness and to be ready to give countries finance to help with the response. 
So the question is, where do we go from here? How can we get enough finance? Um, and how do we make sure that the finance routes that, um, are actually fitting with, again, that, those things like the preparedness system that are going to be put into place? The big issue that is really being negotiated and worried over in Geneva is that second one, though. How do we get into a situation where the, the, the real access to global public goods by everybody works, a system that's really obligatory to do that? And of course, there are big debates because of the issues from um, innovation in the pharmaceutical industry, um, but also how countries do get um, access to both manufacturing capacity across the world and the technology transfer that's needed. When it says fragmentation of science, that means that there are a lot of different bodies in the system at the moment um, who are doing the R&D support, uh, where innovation is coming from, and those all need to be put together in some sort of line so we can see how we do it. And as I've said earlier, the issue of One Health needs continuous work on. It seems unlikely we know enough exactly to put obligations into the treaty, but it could definitely be become a protocol of that treaty in the next few years. So that's what's um, unresolved. And to finish off, the process now. Last week um, was a, a, a forefront week in that we now have a zero draft of the treaty and negotiations started formally last week and they will go on right through into early next year. There is a difficulty that's, that's also happening, though. The international health regulations are also being reviewed and countries are putting in amendments. And it, what everybody is concerned about is making sure that two things the regulations, which are much more technical, and the uh, principles and actions of the treaty must really add up together. So that's a big issue for everybody and quite difficult for all the countries to work on the negotiations on two levels, uh, uh, you know, all at the same time. The IHR has got to be subsidiary to the treaty. Now, the date for when the treaty will be agreed is set for the moment at May 2024, when, that, when the World Health Assembly meets. And it is really important that we all keep the pressure up behind the treaty so that in May 2024, we really can, can set about and be ready for the next uh, outbreaks because we know they're coming. And, we, and this is our moment to show the world that we can improve, we can work together, we know what has to be done. And this treaty ought to really help all countries to get on board and deliver that. So thank you very much indeed for listening to me. And I say, I'm sorry not to have my picture up all the time because of the um, what's happening on the, on the, in the IT sense. But thank you very much for listening to me. And I'll just show you my picture again at this moment. Thank you. Gracias a usted, thank you, Dr. Dr. Barbara. Talking, you have made an approximation with regards to the lessons that we learned with COVID-19 and what still need to learn. The new treaty for the Global Public Health Convention should assure the commitment of governments, the follow-up of world guidelines where we there is a need to have solidarity, equity, transparency, and accountability. All this world effort to improve the surveillance and response systems has an approximate cost of $10.5 billion and you are proposing an independent evaluation that would allow to learn about the real progress of the systems that may have to face a pandemic like we had with the case of COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Stocking, Thank you. for your excellent presentation. 
now we would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Patricia Garcia Funegra. Dr. Patricia Garcia is a senior professor of the School of Public Health of the Peruvian University Cayetano Heredia. She is an internist, infectious disease specialist in epidemiology. She has been Minister of Health of Peru, former Dean of the Faculty of Public Health of the Peruvian University Cayetano Heredia, and former head of the Peruvian National Institute of Health. She is recognized as a leader in global health research. She has been a member of the technical advisory group of the Pan American Health Organization Foundation, board member of the Consortium of Universities in Global Health, and president of the Latin American Association Against Sexually Transmitted Infections. In addition, she is a member of several international advisory committees on public health and global health issues and a temporary consultant to the World Health Organization. Dr. Garcia is an affiliate professor of the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington and the School of Public Health at Tulane University. She is actively involved in research and teaching in public health and global health. Reproductive health, STIs, STDs, HIV, HPV, and biomedical informatics. She has over a hundred articles published in top scientific journals, and she's the author of books and book chapters. She was recently appointed member of the National Academy of Medicine of the United States, becoming the first Peruvian professional with such distinction. Dr. Patricia. Go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for allowing us to participate in this webinar and come with this topic that's so important to professionals and citizens of our Andean region and Latin America region. I'm going to start sharing the screen and it is precisely As a member of this panel for a global public health convention, I would like to emphasize some of the topics and the different messages that have been presented by the two previous speakers. And it is precisely what I would like to talk about this global treaty for pandemic prevention in our Latin American region. We have heard about the international health regulation. This is a very technical document that is quite old, as Dr. Mari Carmen Calle presented, Dr. Bengolea presented. This regulation has been working, quote unquote, and it made, it made countries to comply with certain conditions and carry out self-evaluation, but it was shown that that didn't work. And what we need is to have technical guidelines, but we also need to have a much higher level that will allow us to have a document that, in addition, would allow us at the international level to have a better joint response. And this is precisely what we're talking about, the global treaty. Now, this treaty starts because of the recognition of this catastrophic failure of the international community to show solidarity and equity in response to coronavirus disease pandemic. I don't have to remind all of you how sad was it that we learned that we depended of international networks for inputs for protection protective equipment, face masks, not only face masks, but gloves, and so many other inputs that didn't arrive to our countries because we would not manufacture them, but not even by solidarity or equity, because all the countries were trying to keep what they had for themselves. This catastrophic failure made that many countries received the vaccines quite late. 
So the World Health Assembly in a special session in December 2021 and responding to the many claims of the establishes an intergovernmental negotiating body called the INB, open to all member states and associated members to start discussing and negotiating a document that will go beyond the technical part, a document that could be called a treaty, a agreement, or another international instrument from WHO that will allow to work in terms of prevention, preparedness, and response to pandemics, not only as an instrument that will allow uh, global adoption and to have a short name, we're calling this instrument, here's in English, WHO, which CA plus, and this is how we know it. Now, where are we at this moment? Where there have been a number of meetings in February 1st, a few days ago, we launched and disseminate what we call the zero draft or Z ZD of this document was released. This is quite long document, a structure with a preamble, a vision, eight chapters and 38 articles in total. It's extremely long. Now it includes uh, topics, equity, capacity building and maintenance, coordination, collaboration and cooperation in financing for health systems, pandemic prevention, preparedness, response and recovery, as well as some institutional arrangements at the national level, at the regional level, and of course, globally. Now, this document, which is available, is receiving comments and should be discussed at the next GNI meetings, as Dr. Barbara mentioned, the idea is that this document that will no longer be a draft because it's been enriched by all the comments should come to the World Assembly and be accepted in May of 2024. Now, in reviewing this document that is available, and this is one of the reasons why we're celebrating this webinar, because everyone, everyone in this world should learn about this document, not only health profession, but all professionals that are related to social economic aspects, but also the citizens should know that this is, that this needs to be considered for the coming pandemics for a better coordinated global response. So there are several aspects that we as a panel have found that need to be incorporated or revised in this zero document, zero draft. Firstly, it's not enough to call on solidarity or equity, but we need to establish clear lines of actions and accountability. In English, it's said accountability. That's being responsible for what you do. There's not a perfect translation for accountability in Spanish. It's why do I do things that I do and I, how should I do it before and during a crisis? This is something that needs to be very clearly specified and we still don't see it in this document. Number two, we need to include incentives that promote taking the right decisions and the right actions. Because as it has been mentioned already, to sanction, with immediate sanctions, it may be complicated at the country level, country's level, and may also make some countries afraid of participating in treaties or these type of documents. Because the word treaty, conditions and reaction because many of the treaties have sanctions. And what we want instead is to be able to do early identification of what's not working. So how can all as a group 
together because we know a that we need a global response for crises such as the pandemics. We can help that those who are in a lower situation can be helped so no country in the world is at risk of failing. So how to include incentives that promote taking the right actions and to do the timely report for better responses. The third one that needs to be incorporated is financial and technical support for those countries with fewer resources. As Barbara mentioned, these are some of the issues that have not been solved yet. And finally, and not least but not less important, we need a global system to monitor and ensure compliance with the provisions of the treaty. Now, when we talk about global systems with an effective authority and accountability mechanism to protect people, we ask ourselves, are there experiences in this? Yes, there are, and I'm going to show one. In 1945, hundreds of thousands of people died as a result of nuclear attacks during World War II. And shortly thereafter, the International Atomic Energy Agency was established with sufficient powers to conduct on-site inspections and investigate potential violations of nuclear non-proliferation treaties. And this is working more or less and allow us to maintain the security that we need globally. Well, we need a global system that is not only that one country reports what they have. Peru, for example, in their reports about the preparedness conditions knew that we're not, we were not prepared. But the, there was a no recognition that that was failing and how could they help Peru to improve so that Peru could be in better conditions. And many of the countries in the Latin American region had the same conditions. So there are experiences and there is a need to have this global system in place that will see what are the countries doing, what are we lacking, and how can we help that the conditions are the ideal in preparedness and response to pandemic. The pandemic treaty should include that countries might be accountable to their citizens because their, the government should be responsible and be accountable. And at the regional and global level should work together and be accountable to each other, building mutual trust. Collaboration and mutual assistance between countries should be codified in the treaty. In Latin American region, we have experiences of working together. For example, vaccinations. At a specific point, Peru produced vaccine against rabies and to reduce the risk of rabies coming into the countries through the south, we know that our neighboring countries, as Bolivia did it, couldn't produce the vaccine. We collaborated with them. And that mutual assistance represented benefits for both. We have that experience. But during COVID, this did not happen. And it neither happened between regions. Africa is working in order to have a global response. And we don't have that in Latin America. This is an opportunity to start discussing what can we do for those circumstances where in the region we don't have all the capacity to do it or we have to require financing. That is why the pandemic treaty should include technical assistance and financing without which this treaty will not achieve its objectives. It is necessary to create incentive to help countries, especially those with limited resources. And that is why we are doing this call on Latin America. Latin but there are a lot of inequities in the Latin American averages, which show that there are groups that have a lot of resources but the country is not the same. These countries that have limited resources should have access to incentives that would allow them to comply with certain objectives in a progressive fashion so they can be prepared 
for a pandemic and have a better response. It's not just of having a treaty that demands that all have open data, because many times that at the end becomes a way of penalization, the borders are closed, there's a drop in tourism. And so how do we make those conditions that are not at the adequate ones can start a response to help the country to do a progressive improvement according to their capacities with help and assistance so they can reach a level that would allow them to have similar to the other countries. And that reduces the risk among everyone. And another major a governance structure that ensures that all countries are responsible and accountable to the international system as a whole. Finally, when we talk about Latin America, when it has to be clear that unfortunately each country in Latin America, in our Andean region or throughout Latin America, fought them by themselves and we failed. And the problem is that at this point we should not fall into pandemic amnesia, ignore what happened and move ahead. This is an historic opportunity to elaborate a pandemic treaty that can really make a difference and that includes the region's perspective. But to do so, it is necessary to know it, discuss it, and propose improvements and support it. We need increased participation in negotiations. How many of our ministers of the region learn or know about this document? What is the Latin American participation? As, as far as I understand, and I'm sure that Laura and Barbara will mention it, very few countries in Latin America that are participated in this. And this may be due in part because there are two parallel discussions that should also go hand by hand. One is the health regulation. Now, this is a technical subject. Here we're talking about something that's above the technical level and allow us to make the other part better. But in this higher context and perhaps more critical, which is a treaty, the Latin American region is not necessarily participating as a whole. And remember that this is not if there's going to be a pan new pandemic or not. And I don't want to frighten anyone and we would like to leave this behind. But we wouldn't like to be surprised because we don't talk about if there's going to be a pandemic, but instead of when is it going to come. So we need to be ready. Thank you very much for this space. And I'm sure that there are going to be questions at the end. The issue is that we as a region, as citizens, we need to know that this is happening and demand our governments to participate in this negotiation, not to be afraid of a treaty, but instead make sure that the treaty does what we need needs to be done with accountability and that we can be prepared for when a new crisis comes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Patricia, for your presentation. It is very important to highlight some of the things that you've underlined. But at this moment, there's a world discussion focus on WHO to prepare a document that has a zero, doc, zero draft that establishes a number of measures and procedures to transform this technical document and give them a higher reach considering other aspects that we're not considering initially that have to do with accountability, transparency, that need to have solidarity in their response among countries, the need to strengthen the discussion in different scenarios. And Latin America is a space that still doesn't have an active participation. You made us an excellent recommendation of starting a process of dissemination of these agreements and also the need that these ones must be uh, disseminated in order to have a prevention and control of pandemics. Finally, this treaty to 
prevent a pandemic needs more dissemination and also the need to establish progress and criteria to improve the proposals given at this moment for that document. Thank you, Dr. Patricia. And now we will We invite Dr. Heber Cuba. Dr. Cuba is a medical surgeon graduated in 1982, fellow at the University of Craiova in the Republic of Romania in Europe. He joined the Peruvian Medical Association in 1983, specialist in internal medicine from San Fernando School of Medicine of the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos and gynecology and obstetrics from the Catholic University of Santa Maria Fariquipa. In addition, has management in health services from the Sun and graduate from the Master's and Doctorate in Philosophy at the University of San Marcos, course on strategic management of defense and crisis management, CDIAC, from the Postgraduate School of the Peruvian Navy senior advisor of the Health Commission of the Congress of the Republic from 2011 to 2012 and to 2016 to 2017. Co-author of the book, Peru Vision for Leaders for the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, APEC 2016, with the sectorial theme, Health Pending Tasks, published by Centrum Catolica. Go ahead, Dr. Cuba, who will comment these proposals to strengthen the implementation of this new document or treaty. Good afternoon. My greetings to everyone here and congratulations for this event because it highlights one of the crucial problems at this moment because the pandemic has evidenced not only how the world works, but also how countries can lock down and organize, organize in small blocks. And at the end, it shows that when there is a pandemic, it affects in first place the poorer, it affects everyone, but the largest impact is on the poor and also older countries, but the most negative impact in the less developed countries or who live in situations of poverty. In that regard, the idea is to demonstrate how the way that the pandemic was managed has allowed that each one solve their problems in their own way, and actually what happened was an ineffective system and resulted that some countries were most affected, and one of them, as we had mentioned, was Peru. This reality can be expressed in figures in the economic, political, or social aspect, or even in the cultural aspects. And we can put numbers to all those issues of inequity and justice, or increase of the gap between government, between states in different sectors, and even men and women. So we re this topic requires a world reflection. And here we can see what is a legal framework in this world to deal with this? And firstly, we had the International Health Regulation. As we all know, it's a regulation that has many advantages, but however, is based on reporting of information receiving technical support from WHO, but when we require international coordination for a 
world response to face the pandemic, this didn't have the possibility to do it. There were recommendations that were not even followed. And on the other hand, the states, and as an example, but I sent to you the example of Peru. We have learned the 2007 IHR with a modification, but it has not translated in a standard development and there has no possibility of improving the exchange of information or reporting because as we all know, Peru, as many other countries in Latin America, has a fragmented health, fragmented, segmented health system. So it is very difficult to carry out these notifications or reports that require the setup of teams to organize the response that WHO is asking for. So inside, we have serious problems of applications. Many topics of the IHR have not been complied in the countries, but there was also a large space in generating mechanisms of coordination among countries to have a unitary response to this pandemic. And this is quite serious because there were no mechanisms for promotion measures or measures for prevention against pandemic. And when this occurred, as it has been said already, there was a very slow decision making. They did not believe that this could happen in our country. And with the politics speeches that indicated that everything was under control. However, that now has to be proposed as an alternative. What are we going to do? Are we going to stay put like we are now? Or there's a need for us to generate coordination mechanisms worldwide. And this is complicated for several reasons. Firstly, because we need to be realistic in this world that the world lives in blocks in, with conflict. These wars in Europe, for example, this war doesn't help for this discussion. But the major advantage that we have is that health may be considered at the margin of political positions and if the governments trade with, among them, they need to use this type of tool in order to do things adequately. But we also need to add that one of the essential aspects are the, difficult, the difficulties that we have from other countries of international organizations to control what we're doing in the country. But we also see the opposite. It's very difficult for the countries who contribute to this international organization can control them. So there's a two-way lane that needs to be discussed to generate mechanisms for accountability, not only at the, from the states, but also for the institutions that are created to carry out these agreements. And it's also important to point out that when we see this type of pandemics, we see uh, economic or political uh, confinement situation. In Peru, the government wanted to declare a cholera epidemic because they didn't want to interrupt international trade that Peru had. And there was a discussion at the Ministry of Health that led somehow to some differences between the president and the Minister of Health. So all these experiences serve us to justify and to propose ideas of what to do. And the alternative seems to be, on one hand, to improve the IHR so that we create mechanisms for a better relationship among states with a number of ethical principles that will allow generate mechanisms of efficient response with solidarity and perhaps with social responsibility. However, that takes time and requires to remove everything that we have at this moment. And as Patricia Garcia mentioned, will be to 
consider a larger topic when the substance is quite complex. It's more politics. What, how do we coordinate a world treaty to generate mechanisms that will produce co-responsibility throughout the world? And that phrase given that we, we all suffer the pandemic and we all need to work together. Considerar. ¿Qué es lo que deberíamos incorporar? So we need to consider what are we going to add and we find ma major difficulties. It has been said that we're going to provide more incentives and sanctions because sanctions, as we know by experience, like we saw with IHR, although so far any country has made use of those mechanisms for solving conflicts, either the IHR was not applied fully or lack of interest, other countries resolve their controversies differently. So this is a first topic that we need to consider if there's going to be any level of action or we're going to go directly to the incentives. There's an anecdote that I would like to share. This is the visit by WHO to Wuhan laboratory in China. And there was a great controversy because of the verification of the lab, that audit that need to be done that generated a lot of controversy. This is, for example, an aspect that made WHO and we could take as background information to generate this mechanism of control and surveillance in the treaty. The other topic is the financial support for in terms of promotion and prevention as a first step, and that will require large financing. I don't know if the calculation has been made up considering these subjects, but this is an essential aspect. On the other hand, those who vote are the states. And here, and that I thank for the invitation for this webinar, that we need political effort at the decision levels of each state with our ministers in the foreign relationship uh, ministries, and then leaders of each of the political parties. So this can become a state policy, a long-term policy that we carry out to implement a world treaty or agreement. Because if this is promoted by a single government, this may just fall. So we need a mechanism for a large discussion with political stakeholders in the Congress or the ministers of the country so we can coordinate a international proposal. I think that the most important is the Peruvian government or the governments propose the world coordination of generating a treaty for a world response that will avoid that was the <clears throat> favoring developed countries for vaccines and leaving the poor country with no vaccines or the uh, lack of face mask or PPEs. I think that all those poor negative experiences should be solved with this treaty at the world level. I would like to express my satisfaction. The, the debate is moving ahead. I thank the contribution of Patricia Garcia with this zero draft. And I think that more than moving theoretically, we need to use different political spaces to accompany this process. So each one of us should contribute to make that our foreign relations office and our government 
com participate in have international support. Thank you to each one of you. Thank you, Dr. Luis Bengolea, for your moderation. Thank you very much, Dr. Herbert Cuba. Very important comments. And you taking valuable inputs to contact that crucial scenario for decisions such as the political space is in our Congress and the need to establish other mechanisms to coordinate the efforts of the leaders in the different scenarios of the Americas and the Andean region. And in the case of Peru, well, thank you very much. After these valuable presentations, we're going to move on to the questions. Firstly, we would like to thank all the connected people from the Ministry of Health, academic institutions, social organizations from Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. We will also greet countries that are connected at this moment, such as Argentina, Belize, Cuba, France, Guatemala, England, Mexico, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, Spain, among others. Well, we invite the speakers to please start your videos. We're going to start can be responded by the speakers. The first question is who should organize and organize the countries to sign this treaty? How to come to an efficient consensus Let's start with the order of presentations. Dr. Laura, you could begin. Thank you, Luis. I would like to take the opportunity to apologize because I have to leave. I understood that this panel lasted one hour. I'm in Panama in a, another activity. I need to go back for a lunch, working lunch that I have in a few minutes. Once again, to thank you for the space. I think this is extremely important. And I would like basically underline the emphasis that Patricia put about the urgency that the countries of the region get involved in this discussion and to respond to that question. We, that's where we need to start from the civil society from the different groups that have impact in these discussions, we don't generate a positive pressure to the governments in the sense of demanding the, their active participation in this type of negotiations, and hopefully not only participation, but also leadership. We're not only gonna be left behind, and there's also many interests that are from the countries of the less developed, relative development, it is not the same to talk about the challenges of the treaty from a developed society that from the countries that are under development. So we need to raise our voice. I would like to say that when the process started, we saw some important contribution of some countries such as Chile, Costa Rica, they were actively participating we need to recognize that the region have just closed what they call the super electoral cycle. We have new governments starting. Some governments have asked for time to get used to and see what's going to happen, but we certainly need their involvement. The organization for excellence to call for this discussion is WHO, but this is a something that we need to take to the United Nations as the most important multilateral organization and the session. We also need to bring some regional organizations like the one in our region that we have discussed in the 
OAS, although there's no specialized staff, we have representative of the governments that will establish the priorities of the regional cooperation. So just to underline the urgent need, and this was the intention of this call to push governments for more participation. Thank you very much and my apologies again. Bye bye. Thank you very much for your participation. This will not be the first one. Thank you so much again. We will continue now. The following, would you like to answer that question? Go ahead, Dr. Stocking. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, I would strongly support all of you that have spoken that said that there needs to be more work done. Um, first of all, at the individual country level to get more people understanding the importance of this. Um, and one of the reasons is that in due course, countries will be asked to agree to this treaty, but also then to ratify it in their own parliaments. So it's really very important that parliamentarians who've got particular interests in, in health and global health should really be um, engaged and knowing about what's happening there. So that's that's the first point. The second point about, um, I, I, I hesitate to come into this because you are in the region and you know best how to organize, but I was very interested. I was in Geneva last week and all of the regions across the world are beginning to organize themselves a bit more um, towards this treaty. Um, Africa has, has come together very strongly indeed under the leadership of South Africa. And obviously as people have talked about, those issues about drugs, vaccines have been the ones that they've been really, really pushing for. Um, but, but each of the regions was able to speak um, last week with a number of countries in their region all coming together to make a common statement. Now, what I also found out that was that last week, before last week, some countries in Latin America were joining together. Already, as, as was mentioned, Chile was one of the early people in this because they were in the group that was called the Friends of the Treaty globally. And they are now still doing that, but I think also working with others to try to bring together the countries. And I know that Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and I think several other countries came together to agree what to say last week in the debates on the zero draft. But of course, that's not enough. That doesn't that doesn't incorporate Peru. It doesn't incorporate other very important countries in the region. So the more you can do to help bring together the countries across the region to have make some common stance, if not on everything, on some certain major issues, the more power I think Latin America will have. And I do think that is perfectly possible and very important now. But I, I say I'm speaking as an outsider to the region and it's it's for you to decide. But um, seeing what was happening last week, getting people together in regional groups is very important in this treaty development. Gracias, doctora Barbara. Muchas gracias, Barbara. Adelante, eh, Patricia. Thank you, doctor. Yes, I believe by summarizing what Laura and Barbara mentioned, here we need to see how we push from up, down, sideways, bottom up. So we need that the citizens know that this exists and they can push their governments. A number of changes have occurred in the governments in Latin America. Governments that knew a little bit about this, what usually happens when there's a government change, there's a discontinuity in some differences, and that may result that many of the Latin American countries are not in the table where they should be. We know that the civil society help us pushing this in the case of Peru. We have mechanisms like the round table to fight against poverty while we try to inform about this so they can also push from their side. We need that perhaps the journalism, people who work in media, 
start putting this on agenda because we talk about a number of things, political stability of our countries. They mentioned all the priorities that get together and make us forget. So that was talking about the pan pandemic amnesia, but we need to keep this presence of how can we get ready for the next one. So Herbert's participation with the idea that we can reach the Congress, how do we involve political parties so this can become a line that guides countries because this preparedness on this treaty should be maintained and improved in, with time. We need to sit in the table. We need to make what, that what we need there is included in the treaty. We need to promote that Latin America comes together. Africa has made great strides, but in Latin America we're quite fragmented and this goes beyond just the health sector. However, most of people in the health sector in Peru don't know about this. And I'm sure that that happens in many countries. The fact that we have the webinar with ORAS, hopefully will get us together so we can take this subject to the discussion table of the ministers of the Andean region. So we need to push from every side because we need to have a better response, but not only blaming countries, but we need to work, having countries being responsible, but we need to work in an organized fashion. And we need to have mechanisms of accountability and a different way of working because during the COVID, nothing worked or it didn't work. Thank you, Patricia. Dr. Herbert, go ahead. I think that the main ideas at the macro level are quite clear. Perhaps we need to refine some details. For example, we should have clarity with a glossary of terms to express why a treaty, why is it important that developed countries and poor countries agree in a treaty facing a pandemic? Why can underdeveloped countries can work their own problems in a pandemic? Or why is it important that poor countries are interested in having this type of treaties? The second idea is that we need to do a clear explanation of national sovereignty is in a pandemic. Explain people that the pandemics don't follow borders or respect borders. And today, with large world trade, in international communication and passenger transportation, the pandemics occur very quickly, like we've seen. This issue requires a lot of persuasion because the states are reluctant to sign treaties because somehow they lost sovereignty in some aspects. However, it is not possible to treat a pandemic from a country alone. And third, the lessons learned from other cooperation spaces. Here we need to point out that negotiations with Chile, for example, to open the borders with the COVID-19 pandemic. They closed their borders and there was no trade. The two Tacna cities of Tacna Arica could not trade between them or visit their family members that were at the other side of the border. And for that, we came with agreements with the government of Chile that were respected in both countries. One of them was, for example, vaccination. So those experiences at the local or regional level should be considered. And the other remaining aspect is to make use of the regional blocks. We have 
this space that we are today, but there are others that we should commit to do a this previous discussion of the topics. This is in the macro level because that's going to unite us. Then we're going to have some controversial details. But once we reach those details, is when the process is more advanced. And I believe that the important thing is to look at a topic that can unite everyone to have national consensus. In the case of the Peruvian Congress, we could make the presentation of this zero draft of WHO in the Commission of Foreign Relationships in the Health Commission, a joint session between the Health and Foreign Relations Commission. So both commissions can learn about this topic and know that this is being discussed throughout the world and that's going to have a lot of implications for the country. Then it will also be important that these commissions con consider the Ministry of Foreign Relations, the Ministry of Health, so they can explain to the Ministry of Defense what are the implications and create a debate or discussion. And in addition, open other spaces with civil society that we can make a large current of opinion in favor of this treaty because you usually if you don't look at this you don't consider it because you think that our governments are making all their efforts to fight against the pandemic but actually sometimes these topics escape from the governments in the peruvian case and i was really ashamed Laura Chinchilla told us that we're number one in death by pandemic. And this is a shame. It should be a shame because in Peru, we believe that we are a country that has mid type of development and we could have handled the pandemic better. This is the topic that we need to discuss. Finally, I believe that better than get to the finish line, is to is a process with discussion called the academic area universities that the students start learning about these topics the courses offered by the public health teachers in epidemiology talk about these topics so we generate young leaders that can promote this process because it is obvious that this is a long process once again thank you miss dr bengolea Thank you, Dr. Cuba. Here we have a very interesting question that's going to clarify what do we mean by zero draft? If you're proposing that the final version of the zero draft, draft by, this is an update of the IHR or is an international regulation that's complementary? Dr. Barbara, could you please respond? Thank you, thank you. I'll just take the video off again now. Um, first of all, the IHR and this treaty are not one and the same thing. There are two separate sets of negotiations going on, which is very complicated. <laughs> but the just re remembering again, really the IHR has the technical issues in it. For instance, um, you know, should you actually, um, what's the time frame in which you might submit your um, samples, for example, um, if you have an outbreak? Very technical. Um, but the one thing that the IHR does not have is any compliance measures in it. And the new treaty is rather different because it will have compliance measures and it, it will have that ratification by your own governments, which is very important. Um, for all that accountability. Now, what is this zero draft? Um, it, it's um, for all of us who are new to writing treaties, um, it's quite difficult to understand. But what has happened with the, it is not about the IHR, people have sent in um, their amendments to the existing IHR and that's what's being negotiated. The new treaty, um, the zero draft has been made up of all the issues that all the member states think should be in this treaty that concerns pandemic preparedness and response. 
So you can imagine that the various meetings that have been held, um, and this is all member states, all 194 of them, there have been many, many things put in, but some of them perhaps already excluded because they don't relate to the development of pandemics or the definition of pandemics or whatever. Um, but the zero draft is the first one that was written um, actually as a proper legal statement that could be discussed and negotiated. So what they're doing now is actually negotiating line by line in the treaty what is already there and what is going to be agreed by member states. Um, so they've got a big job on um, at the meetings now. There are meetings, at the, there's another meeting uh, in the beginning of April, there'll be then the World Health Assembly, then there's another meeting in June and so on. And all through that, member states are actually making it clear what their acceptance is of particular lines in the treaty or their rejection of those lines and what should be put in instead. So the zero draft was really the, the, the time when everything was brought together about what member states wanted and sorted out and actually put into legal words. And that's the thing that is now being negotiated at this moment, going through, as I say, um, right into the early next year. But so it's, it's the absolutely key moment for all countries to be involved if they want to make sure that the right things are being said in the treaty, even if um, you agree with the policy, you may think that the way it's written down is the wrong thing and puts the wrong requirements onto countries. So it's it very, very important at this time that people, people do understand more what's in it and how they can engage with it. So I hope I hope that that helps a little. I don't know, but for, I'll leave it to others to explain more. But thank you. Claro que sí, doctora. Adela. Yes, of course. Dr. Patricia. Yes, Barbara, you've been very clear. It's very important that we differentiate the IHR. It's been reviewed, but this is a mostly technical regulation. She gave an example. It talks about what should be done, how to do it, but it's mostly technical. This treaty is a legal document that pretends to establish the responsibilities and actions that your governments do and the interrelationships globally among countries. And as I mentioned, this is quite extensive document that has eight chapters, and that does have a glossary of terms. And in that glossary of terms, it includes different aspects because countries are being adding things in order to get this first draft. It includes issues of sovereignty because when you talk about treaty in the heads of many countries, especially countries with less resources, we've always seen somewhat crushed by treaties because most of the treaties are commercial treaties. For that reason, on one hand, it is important that we participate so we can make sure that what's being drafted doesn't affect us, but it ends up being of benefits for everyone, not only government, but citizens too. And to make sure that the right incentives are given and that the text is the indicated one. We talk about equity and not only words and terms because we talk about solidarity with the pandemic, but at the end, what we saw is that that solidarity never became an action, but just a wish, but not into action. So the treaty has a higher level. We have the opportunity as countries to participate in this in a formal way because we are member states. At this moment, there are very few countries. Chile is one of them, as I have mentioned. We, we have to participate as countries. We could participate as a bloc. The IHR is being modified from a technical point of view. But we need in this treaty, for example, to establish that there's a governance mechanism to comply with what we need to comply. 
so they can not to avoid abuse for especially for countries with low resources so that we can have ways of making these solidarity mechanisms. I think it was well explained by Barbara, two different things, and we need to be aware of them. One of the things that I want to ask Luis and Mari Carmen, although it is true that you can have access to that document, perhaps in the in your web page, you could have a link for those who wish to review this draft document can download it. It's in English, and as Barbara mentioned, is written in the format used for treaties in WHO. It has legal terms and may be difficult to understand. So I agree with Herbert because one of the things for the better dissemination of this document, you, talk, you spoke about a glossary. I will an interpretation document of why this is important. What do we mean by this or that? Why a treaty? So people can understand, especially all those who were not involved in the process. Thank you. Yeah. Barbara would like to say yeah. something. Yeah, very small. Just to say there should be a treaty now written in Spanish because that is one of the key uh, languages of WHO, and I think it is now translated. So it should be findable for everybody then. Just a comment. Perfecto. Entonces, lo vamos a buscar. Great. Y... We're going to look for it. Luis, if you, you post it in the Horas Conu webpage, that could be another mechanism of dissemination that is important for our region. Yes, of course. And there are many requests for that document that are flooding our social net networks. Dr. Kua, go ahead. As I had already mentioned, that we need to have another document. It is true that the IHR has to be reviewed following the lessons that we had we saw during the pandemic with a number of requirements because of international traffic, etc., need to be reviewed. We want to have to include more things in this IHR. However, in the case of the treaty, these are po po macro political issues that are extremely important for the operation of the world during the pandemic. It is something like There's a direct intervention with science and technology that is extremely important, but we respecting interculturality, we're talking about all the nations in the world. And there we need to see a number of recommendations and instructions that the states will voluntarily have to follow. This is a complicated issue. That is why it would be a good exercise to learn, to know how many recommendations were made from WHO to the states during the pandemic and how many of those were followed by our countries. It would be interesting to know how did Peru complied with all the recommendations given by the WHO. What, what, what happened with those instructions? Or Because that would be a sort of a baseline how a, a regulation that is binding with Peru, that is incorporated in a national legislation, is not followed, is taken just as a suggestion and period. So in case of a treaty, these are going to have a mandatory compliance. And a treaty of this nature requires after signing it, following incorporation in national legislation, a number of regulations inside to, for development of this treaty inside the country. This would be the World Treaty Against Pandemics inside the countries because there are a number of demands made by this treaty and that Peru has to commit to implement in the short term. 
in another aspect that is even more complicated. We have to try to, de to remove politics from this topic because any politic, political article could complicate the good intentions that we have when we point out an international governance on public health topics in moments, difficult moments such as a pandemic. These are some of the conclusions to the question made about this topic. Thank you. Thank you. We are very thankful to Dr. Chinchilla, Dr. Stocking, Dr. Garcia, and you, Dr. Cuba, for your commitment to, to this task. And you can be sure that from our institution, you're going to have major support for the dissemination. Since we're running out of time, we're going to invite Dr. Maril Carmen Calle for her closing words. Go ahead, Dr. Calle, you have the floor. Well, we would like to start thanking Barbara, Patricia, Dr. Chinchilla, who left, and Herbert for giving us this quick overview of this topic. You don't defend what you don't know. And if we don't know exactly what is this treaty about, and our ministers and our officials don't know, they will not defend it. So I think that the first part is that we are fully convinced that health is a fundamental pillar for the economic, human, and social development. There is no doubt about that. And the One Health approach is important in this case, and that we can help, definitely. How are we going to help? I like to do things straight, not much speeches, but action. What we promise as institution is that all of this is going to be posted in our webpage. We have many people who visit our webpage, so the dissemination is going to be done that way. Number two is that this topic is going to be considered as a principal topic in our next meeting of national health authorities. The next meeting of national health authorities is the last Friday of March. So this is going to be one of the, the most important topic. And in this meeting, we propose a topic and each country has to say what they are doing in that regard. So we're going to find out where are we right now? How is Chile doing? So this is something that we're going to consider. And the other topic that we're going to consider with our coordination technical committee, who are they? Well, these are those in charge of the international cooperation offices of the ministries of health of the countries and those who have direct connection with the foreign office of their countries. We also have relations with the foreign relations offices of the countries. So these are the two things we're going to do. This is going to be a priority topic for us. And we will need a presentation. Lucho, please take note for REMSA. REMSA is our highest authority. This is the meeting of the Ministry of Health, perhaps carry out at the end of April, no later than the first week of May. As you know, the Andean Health Organization, the Political Agreement, the authorities are the Ministry of Health of this region. And at this moment, who is, is we fully interest is the pro tempore presidency is in Peru. And in August is going to coincide 
with a pro tempore presidency of the Andean Community of Nations. And there is where we go to talk about trade, tourism, and other topics. All the rest, because this is quite a complex topic. This is not just health. But what we cannot allow is that our voices are not heard. We need to get at least the basic conditions. Our systems have the basic conditions to deal with new pandemics, but there needs to be a coordinated effort, an intersectoral effort, and we need to consider the principles of solidarity, equity, transparency, and accountability that were not considered during the pandemic. If we don't do that, we're not just having le learning from our lessons. So thank you so much for this space. We remember everyone who's watching us that these spaces are posted in our web page and they are repeated, reproduced over and over again. So thank you for this space. As a scout girl, I have three tasks, so we're going to comply with them, but we know that this is a long reach effort. And I liked what Patricia said, which she said from bottoms up, up, down, horizontal, all sides. Yes, this is an extremely important topic. Okay, we invite you to our next webinar. We're going to talk about women's participation this Thursday at 11 p.m. The participation of women in this digital transformation that we're going through globally. Thank you very much for your presence. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.